chapter five. Reduced to Ashes. By 1870, Chicago had become a true metropolis. In the previous decade, the number of people living in Chicago had tripled from about 100,000 in 1860 to nearly 300,000 in 1870. Even more astounding, there were 10 times as many Chicagoans in 1870 as there were in 1850, when the population was less than 30,000. Chicago's economy had also grown enormously since 1850, when the city's fortunes were just beginning to benefit from its new transportation network of rail lines and canals. Reading a guide to the city of Chicago published in 1868, a visitor to Chicago would learn that Chicago had taken the lead in lumber trade. Like the grain and cattle trade, it has developed itself into startling proportions. From 33 million feet of lumber received in Chicago in 1847, it has increased until it reached in 1867 the yeah. amount of 795 millions of feet. The authors of the 1868 guide recognized that Chicago was undergoing major changes in growth. Up until recently, they said, Chicago had been a little more than a place where goods passed through their way on to other markets. It was a buyer and seller on a grand scale, but it made scarcely anything, depending on the eastern states for supplies of manufactured merchandise. By 1868, that had all changed. At the present time, almost every article of much bulk used upon railroads, in farming, in warming houses, in building houses, or in cooking, is made in Chicago. 4,000 persons are engaged in manufacturing boots and shoes. Pianos are also made on a great scale in the city. Of course, Chicago was also home to the McCormick Reaper Works, which employed hundreds in the manufacture of our agricultural machinery. Chicago was making more money and attracting more citizens, but it also was a scene of a cultural flowering. Ignoring the drawbacks complained about by many visitors to the city, like the filthy air, howling noises, and foul odors created by the factories, steam engines, and sewage, the author of the guidebook boasted of the city's wonders, beauties, and its grand hotels, theaters, and opera houses, its lakefront parks, and boulevards. Perhaps the guidebook authors went too far in bragging about the city's Nicholson Pavement a style of street construction unique to Chicago. This is in quotes. It is considered far superior and more durable and economical than stone, which is so popular in other cities, end quote. But because it was made of wood and coal tar, it was also a lot more flammable than the streets in other cities. The not as great fire, October 7th, 1871, a fire starts in a wood cutting mill on the west side of Chicago. No big deal. Fires were an everyday occurrence back then and usually nothing to worry about unless your property was one of the ones in flames. Besides, Chicago had one of the nation's best big city fire departments with a top-notch detection and response system. The department had successfully put out over 700 fires in the previous year. Officials were not concerned. In 1871, Chicagoans were in the middle of the worst drought they could remember. In the first week of October, the fire department had already battled the flames of 28 major fires, twice the average. So, it was an overworked and weary fire department that responded to the fireballs that Saturday night. The fire spread steadily, consuming a total of four city blocks. Bound by the Chicago River on the east, Clinton Street on the west, Van Buren Street on the south, and Adams Street on the north before it was finally contained the next morning but the next day's newspaper warned citizens that the city might not be so lucky in the future. The Chicago Tribune said, for the days past, alarm has followed alarm, but the comparatively trifling losses have familiarized us 
to the pealing of the courthouse bell. And we had forgotten that the absence of rain for three weeks had left everything so dry and inflammable, a condition that a spark might set a fire which could sweep from end to end of the city. That spark would so come sooner than anyone could have ever predicted. So literally the next day, and I have never heard of this first fire, a city catches fire. H.W.S. Cleveland, a landscape architect living in Chicago, later recalled that on October 8, 1871, he had retrieved a copy of the Chicago Tribune during a walk he took to survey the damage caused by the previous day's fire. At breakfast, we were discussing it as a terrible calamity. Little dreaming how soon it would sink into insignificance in comparison with the destruction which followed. It's intriguing to wonder which Chicagoans read this news story and what their reactions might have been. Was it read by William B. Ogden, the first mayor of Chicago, and by 1871 an aging millionaire with a huge investment in Chicago? By rising capitalist Potter Palmer, who owned the year-old fireproof Palmer House Hotel, as well as most of the storefronts on State Street? By John B. Drake, owner of the world-famous Tremont House Hotel? or by Albert Crosby, who was busily preparing for grand remodeling of the stunningly remodeled Crosby's Opera House, an event that never occurred. Two people were most likely too busy to read the papers were Patrick and Catherine O'Leary, Irish immigrants who lived eight blocks south of the previous day's fire. Patrick O'Leary was a laborer and Catherine took care of their five kids, as well as their five cows, one calf, and one horse living in their barn. Even though this was the city, many people still kept farm animals to supply food or provide additional sources of income. The industrious Mrs. O'Leary made a little extra money by selling the milk from the cows to her neighbors. If the O'Learys did read the newspaper that day, it was probably after they did all of their chores which on Sunday included storing a delivery of three tons of hay into their barn loft. Exhausted by the day's chores, the O'Learys went to bed at eight o'clock Sunday night, but a neighbor's party and a friend visit made it hard for the O'Learys to get any sleep. The McLaughlins, who rented room from the O'Learys, were celebrating the arrival of their latest rep relative to make a trip from Ireland to Chicago. A neighbor, Daniel Pegleg Sullivan, stopped by to visit the O'Learys, but finding them already in bed, he crossed the street and sat on a bench to relax for a while. This man, whose wooden leg was made from the same combustible material that doomed the city of Chicago, was the first person to detect a fire in the O'Leary barn. So this is the fireproof Palmer house right here. There's that hotel. And then here's, here's a photo of the O'Leary farm shortly taken after the fire. Screaming, fire, fire. Sullivan hobbled into the barn as quickly as he could. He escaped from all the flames along with a frightened calf, but the barn and several other animals were not so lucky. At the same time, two other neighbors also became aware of the fire. James Dalton woke up the slumbering O'Leary's while William Lee sprinted to Gall's drugstore to pull the signal at the recently installed alarm box. The alarm was supposed to send a signal to the central fire station at the courthouse building. Lee later claimed that the store owner, Bruno Gall, refused to unlock the alarm box, saying he had already observed a fire truck racing to the scene. Gall later said he simply waited for Lee to leave before striking the alarm. 
Either Gall lied about sending the alarm or the box wasn't working properly because the signal was never received at the courthouse. As a backup, the fire department also had a round-the-clock lookout station on the tower of the courthouse building. The lookout on duty that evening was Matthias Schaefer, who was giving a group of visitors a tour of his bird's-eye view of the city from atop the courthouse tower. One of the visitors noticed smoke coming from the southwest side of the city, but Schaefer wrongly assumed it was coming from the smoldering remains of the wood mill that had burned down the day before. It wasn't until about 9.30, an hour after the blaze begun, that Schaefer really realized that this was a new fire. But from the distance, it was hard to figure out which station was the closest. Schaefer sent firefighters from the wrong station to the wrong location. Schaefer later figured out his mistake and asked the dispatcher to send the signal to the correct station, but the dispatcher was worried that doing so would cause too much confusion and decided not to send the signal. It probably wouldn't have mattered anyway. An hour later, the fire was officially beyond control. The fire quickly spread from house to house and building to business consuming lumber yards and planning mills, furniture factories, box factories, paint manufacturers, warehouses, and distilleries. By this time, the fire was so big that all fire stations were on call and no one was having a difficulty finding it. Most of the citizens in the southwest section of the city had begun to evacuate the area, heading across the river to the east or into the prairie on the west. Although, most Chicagoans in the northern and eastern sections of the city were aware the fire, few took the threat seriously. They believed that it would be stopped by the river or by the gaps in buildings provided by parks or especially wide streets. Fire, sir. One person who was slow to take the fire seriously was Mrs. Alfred Hebert, a cousin of the early Chicago settler, Gurdon S. Hubbard. Arriving in Chicago earlier on Sunday, Mrs. Hebert and her husband checked into the Palmer House Hotel. Learning of the fire, she later wrote, we immediately took the elevator to the upper story of the Palmer, saw the fire, but deciding that it would not cross the river, descended to our rooms in the second story to prepare for sleep but Mrs. Hebert was unable to fall asleep and kept peeking through the blinds to check the progress of the fire. At one point, she begged her husband to go out and investigate once more, which he did, telling me on his return not to be alarmed as there was no damage, danger in our locality. Mrs. Hebert reluctantly returned to bed at 11 p.m., but the entire family was roused about a half hour later by a knock at the door to which my husband responded coolly, was wanted. Fire, sir, was the answer about the same moment we were on our feet. The hotel's guests were surprisingly calm about the evacuation. The only gripe was the lack of porters to carry their trunks downstairs, but didn't keep them from paying their bill and checking out before departing. Once outside, they may have wished that they hurried a little more. After hiring two boys to carry a trunk, the family sallied forth a little before 1 a.m. to reach, if possible, the house of my relative, Mr. G. S. Hubbard, on LaSalle Street, a long mile and a half from the hotel. Our boys ran at full speed and we followed, crossing State Street Bridge amid a shower of coals driven by the furious wind from burning buildings and lumber yards, and seeming to be caught by an eddy were whirled in our faces. If they, were, if they thought they had reached a point of safety, they were wrong. The fire continued through the night and into the early morning of the following day, following them on their journey north. As the flames approached Gurdon Hubbard's house, a group of men tore up the carpets to cover the roof, draining both cisterns to keep the carpets wet, hoping if possible to stop the fire at that corner. But it was no use. A wooden block nearly flashed into flame, 
at 11 a.m. The cornice was blazing and we were obliged to go out through the alley and escape the heat and cinders. Another witness, Alexander Freer, a New York state legislator and commissioner of public charities, was in Chicago on business. On the evening of the fire, he was in the Sherman House Hotel, waiting to greet some friends of his sisters. From the lobby of the hotel, he heard the courthouse bells sounding the fire alarm. Nobody else in the lobby seemed overly concerned about it, so Freer did not give it much thought. He would soon change his mind. After hearing that the fire was unusually large, Freer decided to take a look for himself. Walking south toward his sister's home, he soon found himself walking against a human current of panicking citizens fleeing the fire. By about 10 o'clock, he reached the south end of the loop where the cinders were following, falling like snowflakes in every direction and lit the street and there was a great hubbub of men and vehicles. Growing more anxious about the safety of his sister and three children, Freer started to run toward Van Buren Street but the walks were so crowded with people. And the cinders were blown so thickly and fast that he found it was impossible to see, much less to continue walking toward the fire. If he was going to reach his sister, he'd have to find another way. Freer joined a throng of Chicagoans crossing the Adam Street Bridge toward the west. Freer later, later managed to work his way back to his sister's home, where he learned about that his relatives had been safely removed to another location. His clothing scorched by embers, Freer collapsed in exhaustion and relief. Freer and all his relatives would survive the Great Chicago Fire. Chicago in Ashes Many people lost all their possessions in the Chicago fire. Wealthy business people lost fortunes and insurance companies went out of business. Others were fortunate enough to salvage some of their prized possessions. Of course, many tried to save their homes, but as soon as the battle was lost, they turned to saving smaller items. One man even went as far as to bury the family's piano in the backyard. It didn't survive. As the flames approached, some Chicagoans rushed into the streets in an attempt to hire drivers to haul their valuables to safety. Alexander Freer later wrote about how people's efforts to save possessions made it harder to escape the flames. I went through to Wabash Avenue. Here, the thoroughfare was utterly choked with the manner of goods and people. Everybody who had been forced from the other end of the town by the advancing flames had brought some article with him, and as further progress was delayed, if not completely stopped by the river, the bridges of which were also choked, most of them, in their panic, abandoned their burdens so that the streets and sidewalks presented the most astonishing wreck. Valuable oil paintings, books, pet animals, Musical instruments, toys, mirrors, and bedding were all trampled underfoot. Another survivor, a young girl at the time, later recalled how she almost lost her most cherished possession. Her family was all set to leave on two fully packed wagons. At the moment, I remembered my precious doll Bessie had been left in the playroom, and instantly I jumped out and ran back into the house where I picked up Bessie in her crib and carried both away in my arms. So we joined the long procession, which was passing, mostly on foot, people carrying some special treasure in their arms. One woman had a pig, <laughs> all bound for the Northwest. The biggest loser in terms of personal fortune was probably William B. Ogden. A vast extent of his fortune was built on the lumber trade. He may have believed that spreading his investments between two cities, Chicago and Peshtigo, Wisconsin, was a good way to lower his risk. If disaster struck his holdings in one location, then at least the other would be intact. Unfortunately for Ogden, Peshtigo succumbed to its own great fire on the same evening that Chicago burned to the ground. That's unfortunate. But at least Ogden came out of the fires with his life. About 300 Chicagoans and over 1,000 residents of Peshtigo 
were not so lucky. The lumber town situated in the middle of Wisconsin Prairie didn't know what hit it. Because it was made almost entirely of wood, Peshtigo burned even faster than Chicago, with flames traveling faster than a person could run. The first Chicago newspaper to release an account on the Chicago fire was the Evening Journal. The paper stated the sad facts. An area of between six and seven miles in length and nearly a mile in width, embracing the great business part of the city, had been burned over and now lies a mass of smoldering ruins. All the principal hotels, all the public buildings, all the banks, all the newspaper offices, all the places of amusement, nearly all the railroad depots, the waterworks, the gas works, several churches, and thousands of private residences and stores had been consumed. He's passed out. Normally I would stop, but we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and start chapter six. He is out. Reaching new heights. Easily the biggest challenge ever facing Chicago was how to rebuild after the great Chicago fire of 1871. Obviously, nobody would ever suggest that the fire was a good thing, but it did create an opportunity that few other major cities have had. A chance to start over and build modern, wood-free structures. This opportunity attracted some of the world's most talented architects and engineers to the city and eventually resulted in the creation of a whole new architectural style called the Chicago School of Architecture. Wood free zone. It seems hard to believe, but the first buildings to go up in the fire were made of wood. But these were only for temporary shelter and office space until more long term structures could be built. Wood barracks built in what is now Washington Square Park provided shelter for some of Chicago's 100,000 post-fire homeless. Shortly after the fire, the city passed an ordinance banning the construction of wood frame buildings in much of Chicago. The boundaries were from 39th on the south, Western on the west, Fullerton on the north, and Lake Michigan on the east. It wasn't easy for Chicagoans to get back on their feet after the fire. It helped to be well insured or to have political connections. Chicago's wealthiest citizens were soon rebuilding their hotels, stores, warehouses, and factories. In keeping with the will to come back bigger, better, and stronger, many of the buildings were more magnificent than the ones they replaced. John Drake lost several hotels in the fire, but acquired another one for a bargain. As the fire approached the Michigan Avenue Hotel, Drake darted into the front door and offered to buy the seemingly doomed building. The previous owner accepted. Drake's offer and may have well chuckled himself on his way out, but Drake got the last laugh when the building somehow survived the fire unscathed. In 1873, Drake also opened another property, the magnificent Grand Pacific Hotel, the Chicago School of Architecture. The most impressive innovation to come out of Chicago's post-fire rebuilding was the skyscraper. Before the Chicago fire, 10-story buildings were unheard of. After the fire, a rapid growth in population caused land prices to swell. To get the most usable space out of a parcel of land, architects designed buildings that soared higher in the air than ever before. The first skyscraper to rise from the ashes of the fire were built using a traditional construction technique. The outside walls were made of stone blocks, masonry, piled one on top of another. These blocks provided the main structural support for the early skyscrapers. Daniel Burnham and his partner John Wellborn Root 
built a number of these early skyscrapers, including the first building called a skyscraper, a Montauk building, 1882, the Rookery, 1888, and the northern half of the Monad Monadnock building in 1891, but there was a problem. In order to support the weight of the taller buildings, the walls had to be thicker and thicker at the bottom. These thick walls were a waste of valuable indoor space, putting architects back to square one. They were still wasting the expensive land these buildings were standing on. The first architect to get around this new problem was William LeBaron, LeBaron Jenny, who is credited with building the first modern skyscraper, the Home Insurance Building, 1884. Instead of supporting the building's weight with thicker and thicker stone walls, Jenny constructed a metal framework which was covered up with curtain walls of brick and stone. This innovation made possible Chicago's oldest skyscrapers, as well as Chicago's future giants, such as John Hancock Center and the Sears Tower. What really set Chicago School of Architecture apart was that its architects combined practical innovations with style. No other architectural firm blended function and form better than Adler and Sullivan. Dankmar Adler was an engineer who focused more on the physical structure of the buildings they designed, while his partner, Louis Sullivan, made sure the buildings were not only useful, but beautiful. Adler and Sullivan's triumphs include the Auditorium Building in 1889, which still stands at the northwest corner of Congress and Michigan Avenues, and the Chicago Stock Exchange, 1893, which was demolished in 1972 over the protests of preservationists. Sullivan also designed the Transportation Building in 1893, Columbian Exposition's White City. Prairie School of Architecture. Not all Chicago's innovations in architecture belong to the bigger is better school of thought. Unlike the designers of soaring skyscrapers, architects, like Frank Lloyd Wright, set out to design buildings that fit into their surroundings. Ideas and designs put forth by Wright and other minded architects came to be known as the Prairie School of Architecture. Although the Prairie School placed more emphasis on the horizontal lines than the vertical lines of the Chicago School's skyscrapers, the revolts, results were no less dramatic. On the south side of Chicago, in the Hyde Park neighborhood near the University of Chicago, since one of Wright's most ingenious buildings, the Frederick C. Robbie House, 1909, designed for the owner of a bicycle and motorcycle factory, the Robbie House proves that even a three-story building can be breathtaking. The roof line hangs so far beyond the house that it's hard to figure out what keeps it from collapsing. Wright didn't spend his entire career in Chicago, however, one of his most noteworthy designs and the one he's most famous for, was built in Pennsylvania, known as Falling Water. The house is so completely incorporated into its nat natural setting that a stream actually flows through it. May Day. Chicago was undergoing a miraculous rebirth, but not everyone benefited from it. For, for everyone, Pullman, McCormick, Palmer, and Field, there were tens of thousands of everyday people who did hard physical labor and got paid very little for it. This was before federal laws protected workers from unsafe working conditions. Unable to work a decent living, some workers responded by forming unions. A union is an organization of workers whose goal is to negotiate with business owners for better pay and working conditions. When unions don't get their way, they sometimes also organize protests and rallies. A union's biggest weapon is to go on strike to stop working until their demands are met. In the series of marches and rallies taking place in Chicago, workers demanded an eight hour workday. On May 1st, 1886, more than 30,000 workers went on strike. Over the next few days, striking workers and police clashed on the streets. On May 4th, 1886, workers gathered in Chicago's Haymarket Square 
to protect police violence. When police moved in to break up the peaceful demonstration, someone lobbed a bomb into the crowd. Eight policemen and a number of protesters died, some from the fighting that followed the explosion. Eight defendants were found guilty of murder, even though there was no evidence of their guilt. Four of those defendants were hanged and the fifth committed suicide. The three remaining defendants were pardoned by Illinois Governor John Altgeld in 1893. To this day, workers worldwide celebrate May Day on May 1st to commem commemorate the struggle for fair working conditions. The White City. No single event marked Chicago's triumphant comeback as a fire dramatically as the World's Columbian Exposition, held in 1893, just 22 years after the fire. The fair commemorated the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of the Americas one year later. The World's Columbian Exposition would be the biggest and most ambitious World's Fair to date. The newly rebuilt city of Chicago was a great attraction all by itself, but the planners also built an entirely new temporary city to greet more than 27 million visitors who came to the fair. The fairgrounds are commonly called the White City because the buildings were constructed of bright white plaster. As chief architect and planner of the White City, Daniel H. Burnham supervised the construction of the temporary standalone city with more than 200 buildings. The Manufacturers and Liberal Arts Building was the largest covered structure in the world when it was built with over 1 million square feet of indoor space. In addition to the buildings, the White City needed all the other things a city needs, its own water purification and sewage system, as well as its own power plant. It would need a fire department and police force. It would need walkways designed to prevent human traffic jams as well as shady rest areas to provide relief on a hot summer day. It needed enough restaurants to feed as million as 750,000 daily visitors. Several new food items were made their debut, debut at the fair. With limited dining space as well as limited amount of time to see all the wonders of the fair, fair goers preferred food that could be eaten on the go. A caramel covered popcorn and peanut snack, later called Cracker Jack, was introduced at the fair. So was the idea of placing a sausage on a bun, what is now called a hot dog. Quaker Oats shredded wheat, Aunt Jemima pancake mix, and Wrigley's juicy fruit gum were also introduced at the fair. And the blue ribbon for the best beer was also awarded to Pabst. The company was so proud of its achievement that the award has since been a part of the product's name, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer. In addition to feeding the fairgoers and making them comfortable, organizers spent a great deal of time coming up with ways to entertain fairgoers. The nearby Midway Plaisance, a mile long grass avenue, was a site for attractions like snake charmers, belly dancers, and the world's first Ferris wheel. When the architects were planning the grounds of the Columbian Exposition, they wanted to come up with something original. In fact, they wanted to out Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower, which had been built at the Paris World's Fair four years earlier in 1889. After reviewing many plans, 